Okay, sir. Yes, sir. We are live. No, no. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Namrata and uh, IIS team for giving this opportunity as well as Alarjan for mentioning this. I will be talking on management of different level of subluxation during cataract surgery. So we all know that trauma, lens coloboma, primary hereditary systemic disease, malforms, somatosystemia, dermatitis, and idiopathic family subluxation, pseudo solution, high myopia, hypermetal cataracts, and I told you, these are all causes of zonulopathy. Uh, sir, sir, just a sec, Dr. Arulmozi, uh, I think we need the introduction before Dr. Shaba speaks. I, I don't have the introduction details with me. No issue, I am Dr. Mohamed Shabas. At present, I am working with Trinity Hospital. Uh, Trinity is a group of hospitals behind Trinity Hospital. We have almost 8-9 branches. Recently, we are going to come up with Coimbatore, and I will be heading the Coimbatore branch. Thank and you, Mr. Mr. So, Mr. Please, please go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, presentation. Okay. Share your presentation, please. It's not coming, sir? No, it's not. Oh. I thought it is coming. Mm. Okay. Now it is okay? Yeah. Uh, oh, full screen. Yes. So uh, we'll be talking on man uh, management of different level of subluxation during that surgery. And uh, as I already described these points, we'll be seeing the videos of all these surgeries. Management options we have usually we go with phacomultiplication with capsular consent device, uh, devices with in by IUR. The other options are like uh, if you are not able to do that, you can do even ICC or ECC and put SFIO or IRS lens. And if the lens is soft, you can do a lensectomy and SFIO or IRS lens. So when we are doing phaco multiplication, what are the parameters? We call it slow motion phaco multiplication. So what is slow motion phaco multiplication? The bottle height should be low, aspiration flow rate should be low, and vacuum should be low. Phaco power will depend on the density of the cathode. And in addition to that, we should use high density viscoelastic like sodium ionate, conductive sulfate. Mannitol and install give added advantage by reducing the posterior pressure of the thrust. Or the or the stands not helps to identify the vitreous stand in all these cases, and we should always have a standby previous lens or iris crawler in case of any added uneventful vitreous. We can use these lenses. So these are the various things we use uh, for fixing the lens or bag. Uh, we all are very much with the rings. Then injector nowadays nobody use. We use uh, directly with the forceps with the different types of iris hooks and then capsular hooks. This AMS segment is very good. Like we can, even if you have not put a Sionis ring, you can use this uh, to fix in one side. And if you require in both the side, you can fix in both the side. The sutures like 10 zero prolines usually degrades. So 9 zero proline is better and vertex fixture is even more better than that. So this is the newer things which a uh, lot of people are using. One thing I just wanted to point out when we're using only for um, this RS hooks, the capsule margins are lax, and uh, when you remove the uh, nucleus, the positive capsule become very lax. So this the dictum is less than three clock hours. You can go with simple Sionis, a uh, simple ring. Uh, if it is three to six, you can use Sionis along with the uh, AMET segment. And if it's more than six hours, definitely you have to use two arm series or uh, amateur segment along with the series. 
So what I do in the, all these cases, I use a visco separation to separate the product from the capsule. This will help in implanting the CONA state. Then we use CTR or modified CTR. Hook the CTR with the iris hook rather than hooking the capsule. I can hook the CTR with the iris hook and the stabilize the lens back complex. And suture the CONAs at the end of surgery. Use extra ring segment if you see the bride is still not stabilized if, if, uh, after suturing for from one side. So this is what I, uh, the visco separation is. We put the visco between the capsule and the cortex. The visco goes up to the equator because it's a thick, it do not go behind. And this creates a space for implantation of the ring. Here it is more DRT, it is separating the cortex and it is going up to the equator. So now the second thing is to implant the ring. Once you have separated, then you can implant the ring. I usually use forceps to implant the ring and uh, I have either with the Sinsky or the so we can just push it inside and and this is again a, another case in which we are implanted the ring. Now we have already separated the cortex. The advantage of separating the cortex is that this uh, ring will not entrap the cortex. It is the most of the people who don't want to put ring in it in the beginning itself, they say that it entraps the cortex. But I will show you in different videos, you do not entrap the cortex once you have separated the cortex with the capsule. Now, third thing is like what, what I told is to hook the Sionin sink. Once we hook the Sionin sink, the lens back complex becomes very stable. For putting Sionin sink, you can use heat. But once you hook the ring, now the bag as complex becomes normal, as if it is a normal case you are doing. So what it does, Sioni does maintain the circular contour of the capsular bag, avoid collapse of the bag after the lens is removed from the capsule. Most of the time when we are using only the hook, we remove the nucleus and then the capsular bag comes into the paper flow. Provide additional support to the bag by pushing the bag equator to the original position or even beyond and helps I will prevent some I will disintegration and capsular fibrosis. So this is the picture I have drawn. You can see if you are hooking here, this is stabilizing the whole lens back complex. The caps zonule is not present here. So if you are hooking here, this side already the zonule is there and this lens or the bag is taut because of the ring. So now coming to various videos I will be showing in this uh, videos, too many videos are there. Anytime uh, Dr. Arul can ask me to stop. So, this is the heart cap that you can see the large subluxation. I was planning to use a Sioni ring, but uh, in the table or in the paper, it was not there. So, I just put a CTR ring. And you can see the CTR is stretching the capsule. You can hear. You can see the CTR is coming and it is stretching the capsule. Now you can see the capsule is stretched to its normal position. This is a pusher I am using here. You can use a sense field to use a pusher and just uh, put the letter in the back. And now after this, the things are simple. Once the ring is inside, you feel very stable. The lens by complex is very stable. And even hard cataracts you can easily manage. This is a old trauma case that came uh, long after. This is a plate haptic lens, and you can see when putting this, the ring has come this side, but it's still the lens back complex is very stable. Now, if you have a vitreous in anterior chamber along with subluxation, how to go? This is an intumescent cataract, you can see the vitreous is there. I am using transplant to stain the vitreous. Now I have done the vitrectomy. 
and then I will stain the gap. So there are some amount of interest time which I have tried to push it back. The nexus becomes very difficult in all these cases. If you are not able to do nexus in subluxated cases, you cannot do echo in these cases. And as the more difficult case will come, the nexus will see the more difficult. The important thing is intumescent cataract because the lens is too much uh, swollen, so you cannot put the CTR at this stage. So what I did, I did a debulking of the nucleus and then I implanted the CTR. And now you can see that side, the lens you can put easily. It is very well fixed with the iris of the body because the iris of the holding at one side. And I'm just trying to, uh, because the RS above the size from this area, so I'm just trying to make it circular by two, three days. This is another case you can see the vitreous is there. In this, I have done vitrectomy directly because and here you see the vitreous has become very difficult in this case. The whole lens by complex will start moving when you pull this. So you can use two micro forceps, sometimes biomanual technique you can use. Another case I am showing the biomanual technique also. And this area is only repeat, so I have hooked that area and then I am putting the CONI in there. If I do not hook that, the CONI itself will cause zonal dialysis of rest of the area and the, the lens back complex will be floating in there. So it's a hooking of the back to implant CONI swing and then hooking the CONU to stabilize the lens back complex. And uh, this slide with the stag is there, so it's not allowing you to do, remove the cortex. So what I did, I did a vitrectomy and IA cut mode, I can go and aspirate the cortex. And this is the things are same. So I just put, I put a pile of in to see a small PI I have done because it's just a very nice. So if you have a bigger dialysis, what to do? So in these cases, everything remains the same except the challenge is to do the nexus. After doing vitrectomy, when you try to move the gap pull, the whole lens back moves. So you have to be very careful and slowly you have to keep on pulling and just trying to separate the capsule so that it will have less effect on the lens back complex. And I was able to complete the vaccine. This is the most important thing in all this sort of, now we have to separate the cortex from the capsule. I have used two hooks to stabilize at this stage so that the CONE should not cause a constant moment and more damage to the zone. So now these hooks are helping me to implant the CONE brain. Once CONE is dead inside, I will just hook the CONE and now the lens back complex is quite stable. And see the lens back so simple that I am put to even I can move. And there is if things remain the same, I have sutured the same to this way. And if it is even bigger dialysis, what to do? Uh, this is now floating lens, almost floating lens in that. You can see it is just moving around. I think that the only small part of zonules are left in this area. Now here you cannot open the capsule. So what we do is we can cut the capsule and then. So this is what biomanual technique I was telling you. One, you can hold the excess margin. With the other, you can try to extend it. Because if you try to pull, it will pull along with that. The same thing now, once the excess is done, if it's a scoop properly, even the floating nucleus we can do with in diagram. 
So if I am pushing the COD, the whole bag is moving. So I have implanted one more ring in this side. We are all fast forwarded videos because these are big videos. I was very slow and gentle when doing these cases. Now, one question can occur why to do all these things? Somebody saw this video and said, why to do Vinna's laser? I feel in bag alloy is always better than going and removing the hole, and the incision size is small. In this one problem, I was not having the ring segment. So, after putting one at switching this here on it, I saw the lens is moving towards one side. So I have to put another ring, uh, another here on it ring because the ring segment was not available at that. The lens, the lens is descending that side, so I put another ring segment in this side. The segment would have been better, but I was not having, so I put another here. Now the lens is stable in the back. Now, these are uh, some other conditions like family anticipation is from Bangalore and is still coming to me for size. In this, the vitreous space is intact. So, you just use high density discord of high weight. You can push the disco back and you can. The thing is that the vexes become very thick as you try to push the lens back full, start moving. So, you have to be very careful and gentle. And you should not go too much periphery in these cases. The smaller vexes is okay rather than the larger vexes. Because Sioni's rings are already inside, the chances of primosis will not be there. In zero whatever we have put uh, one patient, I saw that it has tangential degraded in five years' time. And uh, recently I have resuited it. I pass another suture and resuture. No, if you have a, this sort of picture, what to do? So here the lens is upward. So after opening the lens, we can use the added hook to drag the lens towards. And when you are coming near the hook, you have to release the hook. Otherwise, it will cause extension of the camera. And once I am using another two hook to implant the CNN. Once the CNN is inside, we are through. You can easily implant the lens and shoot the CNN in that area. Somehow I felt the other opposite side zonules are strong enough to hold this lens because this patient has not come now till now back to it. The same thing is here, right? After making a small opening, we can hook the lens, pull it, and then this I'm using here. And once I come near the this hook, I will release the hook and then complete the hook. And then creating a space again to implant the ring. Rest of the things are same. Now another case, this is again another difficult case because the lens is globular in this. So vexes becomes more difficult in this case. Again, you can use uh, magnetol or resol to uh, make the eye soft. You can use high density viscoelastic to push the lens back. And this, this is what I different technique. I am just rolling the micro faucet. Because when I try to pull it, the whole lens back complex is coming. So I just roll the micro faucet 
so that it will become the gap. Once the fulcrum or once the latter area is covered, then the force required is less. Now here we cannot push the so inside. So we have to debulk the nucleus first and then we can do. So I'm just debulking this nucleus. So after debulking, I'm just creating the space so that I can implant the ring in the Once the ring is inside, the things are same. Hold the ring. I think I'll go to next video now. This is pseudo -metal. This is another condition in which now the lens look stable here, but when we started operating, the lens was uh, like very crab like a, with the, every stroke, the lens bag is moving. But somehow we are uh, was able to do the excess of this. And then after that, the things. Then I implanted as a ring. I thought, like, okay, this is normal pseudo solution, we can implant the. But after implanting, then also once you start aspirating, the whole lens bag was coming towards you. And the lexus, uh, the people started going down in this case. Then I used iris of two. Once the nucleus is out, you can see I will contain the back, but the lens back complex is not stable. So, what I did, I thought, okay, I will use one IMA segment to stabilize this from one side. But when I stabilize it from the one side, it, the whole lens complex has gone towards that side. So, I have to use another ring segment to stabilize this, and then the lens becomes. Thing. There was a small anti minder. Now, this is another thing with like why to uh, stabilize the lens by complex. We can put the lens in the sulcus and optic capture it. The weak back complex can provide support to the lens, and uh, the heptic of the lens will provide support so, so that the lens will not go back and it will not cause further damage. So in this is a type of high myopia with optimized eye. So everything went smooth in this. The, uh, the iris is sloppy, so constricted. And when I was implanting the lens, the lens was going inside. So I have to drag it back. And I did the optic capture of this lens. And this, this was the post of it. And this is another case like uh, the Polohoma. Now, this is like uh, similar to the first case, but this here the tonus will be very weak because of hypermature cap, right? and the capsule will be calcified. So you cannot extend. So you have to cut and then you have to do the excess. I think next to the rest of the things will be same in these cases also. I have put a ring, uh, I have already implanted the CLA, so I have the CLA. So, management of supplicated cataract can be done safe, uh, safely with good IOL stability and visual outcome by maintaining a close chamber and stable lens back complex around the time. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Shabas. Uh, that was uh, very, very illustrative. I have a couple of points that uh, you brought out are excellent. Uh, one is hooking uh, the Sioni ring, which is fantastic, uh, really uh, gives you stability when you're doing the surgery. Second point you mentioned, if you can do the rexis, you can do the surgery safely. If you're not able to do the rexis, doing the surgery is going to be far more difficult. The third one, the wonderful thing that you've shown is the visco uh, space creation, so that you can put in the rings or the uh, segments more uh, efficiently. That's fantastic. I only hope that you're not speeded up your uh, bimanual rexes that you had shown. That would have been nice if it has been shown at normal speed. That would have been fantastic. I have only one question. Um, you've always been using uh, iris hooks on the capsule. Uh, you don't like capsular hooks. I thought they give better support at the equator. 
So both the things have similar functions. Sir. The only thing that it support, you can do cataract very well. Many times, what happened when you have finished the cataract because the posterior capsule is weak and it doesn't have support, it comes in the phago probe, and the aspiration of the cortex becomes very difficult in the probe, even with the with the hooks, capsular hooks also. Mm. Yeah, but uh, capsular hooks gives the support at the equator, which is a little better. Than, uh, so that's what I thought. Other than that, very, very nice points that you brought out and uh, excellent surgeries that you've shown, uh, where a difficult situation been managed, managed very beautifully. And often this is the issue uh, with uh, phaco emulsification. Poor zonules is something that's very difficult to handle. Almost anything else one can handle, but uh, weak zonules can really go downhill as things go on, unless you know what you're doing and you do the right thing. Very, very nice. So anybody else has got anything to observe, questions, discussion? No one else? Okay, thank you so much. Then let's go on to the uh, next speaker. Who's going to come on next? Um, can I ask um, Ma Matthew Kurian to come on next? Are you ready? I'm ready, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. It would be a pleasure to introduce you, the medical superintendent at the Chaitanya Eye Institute in Ernakulam and Parivatala. Am I right? Parivatam. Yes. Parivatam. Oh, Parivatam, sir. Parivatam. <laughs> okay, right. Thank you. Well, that's fantastic. So, we all know Matthew very well. So, he's going to talk about management of small pupil and cataract surgery. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, thank you to AIOC and uh, uh, Dr. Namrata and team for inviting me for this uh, presentation. Uh, can you see my uh, screen? Uh, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yeah. Right. So uh, I will be talking about small, small pupil management in cataract surgery. And to an extent, this is like what lies beneath, you know, because uh, diagnosing is, is uh, may not be even requiring often a uh, slit lamp examination. It's quite easy. A uh, pupil less than four millimeter is uh, uh, easy to diagnose just after maximal medical uh, attempt to dilate the pupil. But why is it necessary to diagnose is because there is uh, often a three times increased complication rate associated with a small pupil. And uh, this can be including capsular uh, rupture with or without vitreous loss. There can be retained uh, lens matter even without a PCR because sometimes a small pupil uh, will hide a fragment of uh, nucleus behind it and that will result in post-operative inflammation. Even without any retained lens matter, post-operative inflamm inflammation is uh, quite often seen. And uh, inflammation by itself or uh, even otherwise, you can have a raised IOP. There can be incidental iris trauma during uh, surgery resulting in transillumination defects and dysphotopsias, all of which lead to a suboptimal outcome for the patient. The risk factors are uh, quite extensive. Uh, common is diabetic uh, patients, uh, especially those with uh, uncontrolled diabetes. Intraoperative uh, floppy iris syndrome has been well documented to cause uh, surprise intraoperative uh, meiosis. Pseudo-exfoliation uh, glaucoma and pseudo-exfoliation syndrome is the biggest challenge for me personally. Long-term glaucoma medications, though pilocarpin use has significantly come down in the recent past. Uh, previous ocular surgery, uh, intraocular inflammation, uveitis uh, can cause posterior sinicae, preventing a pupil dilatation. The iris sphincters, uh, sclerosis due to aging are all causes. And surprisingly, uh, femtosecond cataract surgery as well is associated with a small 20% uh, reduction in the pupil size uh, during surgery. So all of these uh, factors are fairly well documented and common. And in addition, there are a huge list of other uh, drugs which uh, are associated with uh, uh, small pupil. So... <clears throat> The preoperative management uh, uh, counseling is very important because uh, we need to educate the patient about the possibility of this delayed visual recovery. Uh, 
and the potential need for frequent and or prolonged uh, eye drop regimes, even those subject, which include subconjunctival or subtenant injections in the post-operative period. And uh, also, it is important to talk to the patient about the need for control of pre-existing conditions. The pre-operative management for me is uh, you uh, try the in the OPD itself try the routine dilatation, which for me is uh, anticholinergic agent like tropicamide and or a uh, cyclopentylate uh, with uh, phenylephrine 2.5 percent. 10 percent has been tried with uh, no better uh, midriasis, but with the increased risk of cardiovascular side effects. And um, uh, we need to uh, repeatedly apply this four or five times and uh, use a platelet uh, in the inferior phonics uh, in order to make it easier for the staff uh, to dilate and more convenient for the patient also. NSAIDs have a role, but mainly in inhibiting the surgically induced meiosis uh, due to the prostaglandin release uh, with iris manipulation. There is no evidence that they augment the pupil dilatation. Uh, in terms of workup, uh, we do the regular A scan, uh, Optical biometry, if possible. Otherwise, we do uh, immersion uh, biometry, uh, B scan, or OTT to visualize the posterior segment to get an idea of what, whether there's any posterior segment pathology. I would do a specular microscopy in these uh, patients as well. And uh, then uh, the re regular systemic evaluation, which includes maybe specific uh, evaluation for any of the known risk factors if it is present in the patient. So intraoperatively, we would use compounded agents for pupillary midriasis and anesthesia. And this has uh, been there for almost 20 years now. This is a combination of preservative-free cyclopentylate, phenylephrine, and lidocaine. And this was uh, uh, described by Sugar, uh, we, who used buffered lidocaine for uh, pain relief as well as pupillary dilatation. And with the addition of epinephrine in uh, pH-neutral solution, for dilatation, it uh, became the combination became popularly known as epi sugar cane. The risk, of course, of this kind of compounding is that uh, there is a possibility of endophthalmitis or toxic anterior segment syndrome. Though, however, today with uh, many of the companies launching these kind of uh, pre prepared uh, uh, compounds, that uh, risk is reduced significantly. So, interoperatively, uh, here is a case with uh, posterior sinicare. This is post PI, and so your uh, sinicare release uh, lysis is being done while injecting the uh, tripan blue for this mature cataract. And uh, here, uh, a careful uh, capsulorexis is performed. I prefer to use capsulorexis uh, forceps in these kind of situations, microrexis forceps, uh, under. Uh, higher quality viscoelastic, no financial interest there. Uh, typically, uh, viscoat is what I would use. And a gentle hydro dissection to make sure that the nucleus is mobile. And then we can uh, proceed with uh, a careful vertical chopping maneuver uh, in case uh, you feel comfortable enough. Uh, and this is possible in these kind of very rigid pupil uh, because the pupil doesn't move at all. It just stays in that position. And this is not possible at all, even with a fairly larger pupil, if there is a floppy iris, because that would tend to come to the phaco port and uh, there would be iris chafing. So this is uh, one method of handling a uh, small pupil. The bimanual IA is something that I prefer in these kind of situations because I can use the irrigation to retract dynamically the iris and uh, then proceed with uh, 360 degree good uh, cortex removal. So during bimanual IA, I am able to const constantly visualize the entire uh, process even though the pupil is really very small, maybe just uh, three millimeter in this kind of a situation. And finally, a foldable IOL can be inserted through the small pupil 
uh, just make sure at the end of uh, implantation to retract the iris to confirm that the lens is actually inside the bag and uh, that there is no portion of the lens uh, which is uh, outside. Often what is required is this intracameral uh, mitriatic combination and uh, a little bit of patience. Dim illumination, if you will notice, is uh, required for this initial steps. And once the pupil has dilated adequately, you can come back to a proper illumination for the rest of the surgery. Just need to be patient and give it a few minutes. Uh, the other traditional uh, techniques are uh, sinuculysis. Here again, I'm uh, staining the anterior capsule by going under the iris, under an air, under an air bubble. And uh, then once the anterior capsule is adequately stained, we can uh, replace the air and tripan with uh, viscoelastic. HPMC is all that is required at this stage. Uh, and then multiple sphincterotomies can be performed. And which used to be the traditional technique for a long time before uh, the newer devices became available. Stretch pupiloplasty also I have performed uh, in many situations, but uh, both those techniques cause a floppy iris. My preferred technique today, when I know that the zonules are good, is uh, a ring device. No financial interest. I am using the BHEX here. I introduce it to the 2.2 millimeter main port incision and use the microrexis forceps itself to tuck the distal flange under the iris. This is preferably done uh, after dilatation if the pupil is very small. And uh, if the pupil is about four millimeters, uh, then uh, we do not need to do a stretch pupiloplasty before tucking the flanges inside. Alternate flanges are tucked under the uh, iris. The last flange to be tucked in my technique is the subincisional flange. And it is ideal to perform this maneuver before attempting to open the rexus because uh, there is a possibility of inadvertently hooking the uh, rexus margin if uh, rexus has been completed. Once the uh, flange is, uh, the BHEX is in position, then you get a 5.5 millimeter dilatation, which is adequate for uh, almost every type of uh, fake emulsification. And the risks associated with the small pupil are almost completely eliminated in this situation. Fake emulsification can proceed with ease and with uh, uh, a fair amount of confidence, just like in a normal situation. Uh, the pupil remains stable even during uh, implantation of these kind of bulky IOLs. Um, and I approach the ring explantation through the side port uh, under irrigation. Just disinsert the proximal subincisional side port area uh flange from the iris and it will come out through the 1.5 millimeter side port incision itself it gives a physiologically better and more stable uh pupil at the end of the procedure in uvit cataracts so over here for example there is a, a membrane which is at the pupillary margin and uh, often just feeling this kind of a membrane will be adequate to uh, give a good uh, pupillary dilatation. And this can be enhanced with the use of uh, heavy molecular weight uh, viscoelastic. And uh, this kind of a viscodilatation will often give uh, adequate dilatation for a safe surgery. And if the pupil is not uh, floppy, that's adequate for the procedure. I use iris hooks quite frequently, uh, especially in uh, pseudo-exfoliation patients. 
for the simple reason that uh, in case intraoperatively there is a uh, feeling that uh, the pupil, uh, the capsular bag is unstable, we can hook the rexus uh, margin. I typically make five incisions uh, for the side ports, uh, stab incisions for the iris hooks, one under the phaco incision uh, so that the iris is stuck out of way and it does not get uh, damaged by uh, the phaco handpiece as it is uh, entering and uh, exiting the eye. So there is a pentagon shape which is at attained. Um, some amount of uh, sphincter tears happen during this process, uh, especially you don't need to uh, dilate the pupil so much. A uh, little less dilatation would uh, result in a more physiological uh, looking pupil at the end of the procedure. But once you've got the pupil well dilated, the rest of the phaco emulsification can uh, proceed very simply. And I like to remove the iris hooks under irrigation itself uh, so that uh, there is no more visco trapped behind anywhere and IOP spikes at the end of the surgery are uh, less frequent because I remove it under uh, saline rather than viscoelastics. So during this process, you just need to follow the curve of the iris hook to and uh, make sure you disinsert the iris from the uh, iris hook to prevent damage to the pupil uh, and the sphincter margin. So in the post-operative period, we have a higher risk for delayed healing, corneal edema, uh, inflammation, cystoid macular edema, and elevated IOP. And uh, this uh, a good control of the pre-existing conditions such as diabetes and uveitis is necessary uh, in this period as well. This uh, higher risk for inflammation can be due to the pupillary expansion devices that we use, as well as a longer surgical time. And uh, often there are complications uh, like vitreous loss and recent retained lens matters. So based on the severity of the risk, I have an intensive regime, which uh, is my usual dose of moxifloxacin, which is four times a day for two weeks. But then I strep up the prednisolone and I make it hourly uh, for the first week, then weekly taper two hourly, four, three, two, one, weekly taper typically, so that will stop over six weeks. Or in very rare situations, especially in uveitic patients, I will do a biweekly taper uh, and often under the cover of oral steroids as well. My NSAIDs will be uh, uh, preservative-free NSAID, which is used twice uh, uh, daily for six weeks. And uh, in UAT cases, uh, four to six months in a couple of cases. Additionally, I would choose to use homotropin for dilatation, antiglaucoma uh, topically or orally, depending on the situation, and uh, sometimes a steroid antibiotic eye ointment at night for the first one week. And uh, in all these situations, effective preoperative counseling changes the patient's perspective of a poor clinical outcome. Uh, from an unexpected complication to an anticipated effect of a pre-existing condition. And so they are quite a lot more forgiving to the outcomes. So when to refer these cases, when one is not having uh, the requisite skill or not confident of the managing that particular situation. But more importantly, I think when the equipment backup is not there to manage the small pupil, Pupil expansion rings, hooks, stain, microrexis, forceps, etc., need to be there. And to manage complications which can happen reasonably frequently, anterior vitrectomy, a CTR, a multi-piece IOL, SF IOL, or iris clip IOL as required. And uh, a good FACO machine and microscope is uh, mandatory in these situations. And personally, I also feel a good anesthetist uh, who will keep the patient well sanitated and comfortable with the veteroretinal backup as needed. All these things, uh, uh, if not present, it is probably in the best interest of the patient to refer the patient to a higher center. Thank you very much for this opportunity once again. 
I'll thank stop you. Here. Thank you, Matthew Korean. That was fantastic. You really went step by step. The first surgery you showed where it's a very small pupil, but with excellent surgical skill, you were able to handle it without doing any kind of a stretch or putting in hooks. And from there, you went on uh, with pupil expanding. Device. Rather, before that, you went into the intracameral uh, midriatics, which really work in certain conditions. High uh, viscosity, viscoelastics do help you. And you went step by step into the uh, either pupil stretch or the uh, sphincterotomies, as well as the pupil expansion devices. All of them are there in the, our, our armamentarium, and they're really good. They're wonderful. But do you accept that um, with better techniques, uh, better skills, better instruments, better FACO versification machines, we are using less and less of the uh, pupil expansion devices than we were doing a little earlier? Yes, uh, certainly. I, my personal experience is like, you know, uh, there would be uh, cases which preoperatively we would say plus minus uh, uh, iris hooks or pupil uh, expansion devices and uh, intraoperatively if it is not floppy i am quite comfortable uh, going ahead and uh, managing it like i showed in the first uh, situation yeah. um, extreme two millimeter three millimeter kind of pupils i would probably avoid now just uh, in the interest of my own blood pressure but i think uh, uh, it, it is technically feasible. Exactly. Uh, I, I think the most important uh, reason to use a pupil expansion device, even in a four and a half, five millimeter pupil, would be uh, floppy iris syndrome. Floppy iris. Because yeah. uh, that is where, uh, you know, uh, the whole intraoperative uh, milieu is changed uh, mm. compared to a rigid, uh, IO, uh, rigid uh, pupil, which is uh, allowing you to operate in a fairly stable situation. Another point I would like to also add on is one when one is putting in iris hooks to make sure that the ports are made very, very close to the limbus as posterior as possible, not very corneal so that you don't pull up or tent up the iris. That's probably the only point I can add to whatever you have said. I've been very, very nice, very, very, very beautiful. So what is your personal choice if you were having a small pupil, let's say it's a three millimeter pupil, would you choose to put in iris hooks or would you like to put in a ring? one of the rings available, whichever. Um, ring is faster to use and uh, ring does not involve the multiple uh, punctures on the cornea that is required. So my choice is a ring. My contraindication to use a ring is if the anterior chamber is shallow. Okay. So if my preoperative biometry shows uh, uh, 2.5, 2.7 uh, kind of anterior chamber, I would uh, hesitate to use a ring because manipulating the ring in those situations becomes very difficult. I would use hooks in those situations. But otherwise, deep chamber uh, ring would be the first choice. And you have seen me just take it out from the side port. Yeah. It's like uh, gone in a second. Yeah, just so like the, the BH entire is procedure is uh, so fast, so much faster. Particularly the BH link is wonderful. Yeah. One last question. Which would you do first? Would you put the ring in first or would you do the rexus first? Uh, I have regretted making the rexus first uh, in many instances because uh, you complete the rexus, you think uh, at that point everything is fine. And then uh, as the pupil becomes smaller, you want to put hooks. And uh, then with an open capsule, you are trying to put hooks or a ring and you inadvertently damage the uh, rexus margin. And then it becomes a small, comp uh, small challenge becomes a big complication. Yeah. So, if yeah, sir, like, uh, why, if, if, you, if, you, if you have actually decided to put, uh, put a ring or hook, uh, why should you go for a rexus first? Uh, uh, you, no, no, no. Uh, sometimes we think uh, we can manage, um, uh, you know, that's in two minds, you could manage. So, when you're in that kind of a situation, it'll be best, you know, not to think twice and put in the... Uh, uh, no, no, that is, that is, that, that is in a situation where you have, where you have uh, actually decided not to put a hook and this... This comes, uh, uh, see, uh, Matthew, uh, two, 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 two questions. Like, I know. Yeah, uh, I know. two questions, uh, uh, Matthew. Like, uh, see, you go for a uh, common simplification in a small people without any hook or ring, and it, it, it works most of the time. But occasionally, occasionally, if it is not a rigid uh, people, you might, you might have a, uh, one catch on the uh, iris somewhere, and then everything is bad. Like, it keeps coming, keeps coming, keeps coming. So, but it should not happen. You should not catch. But just in case you catch and it becomes floppy in that area and it has a tendency to come to the uh, fake tip, 
what do you do i would put a hook in that area in if that area. inadvertently i uh, have a iris shaping uh, while operating a small pupil at the point where it is shaped or chewed up i would put a hook and you uh, use, uh, use the hook to restrict a single hook may be adequate otherwise at that stage i will very carefully put uh, a lot of uh, high viscosity viscoelastic between the anterior capsule float the iris up and then mm-hmm. it back at four or five points okay I, I, one more one more query like uh, post operatively uh, you you you're giving a, a intensive course of uh, surgery that's good like uh, what prevents you from using a tropin uh, in place of pomatropin uh, so you you if you're thinking about uh, uh, cycloplegia cycloplegia you see probably a complaint might be better but a tropin is the problem with a tropin obviously like uh, you get that dilated pupil lasting for a long time and have uh, glaring eye so this is a case where the pupil is not dilated so so would it uh, uh, be a preference uh, uh, is there is there anything against using uh, atropin uh, or uh, you feel that uh, homotropin is good enough to uh, give that cycloplegia because see uh, uh, in addition to the steroid definitely the cycloplegia gives uh, 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 makes the keeps the eye quiet uh, everything is uh, uh, fine like so so is there uh, anything against uh, using atropin i i frequently use atropin so that's uh, uh, that's the thing so uh, what what uh, what is your uh, uh, take on that uh, right now i use um, homoid uh, homotropin more commonly though uh, during the earlier days uh, uh, there used to be something called atro caps which i don't see now It used to be an atropin ointment so at the end of surgery you put a little bit of that ointment and uh, that's it the job was to be done and uh, you don't need to re- repeat that uh, but i think uh, uh, homotropin itself gives uh, adequate uh, uh, cycloplegia and makes a patient comfortable pain relief is also there as a consequence and uh, it's worked well for me that's about it actually don't you think you're putting a single hook in one area in a small pupil will drag the other people towards yeah. that yeah so uh, a, a, a single hook if i am using would be just to uh, uh, that uh, torn up iris there i don't intend to bring it all the way to the periphery i just want something to uh, hold it from coming into the tip yeah, so that, that, that would be at maybe 3 2 or 3 millimeters uh, 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 very minimal retraction yeah that's what i like guess too for the optimally dilated pupil but if it is small pupil you know, i think it's better to move it like a normal four hook or something yeah. thank you you know contraindication of atropine even uh, like floppy iris or tonsillitis in patients uh, they recommend to use atropine for three years uh, it may help though it doesn't cause that much but it may help in some literature it is shown it may help yeah. right. thank you thank you korean wonderful can i now ask uh, jacob matthew to speak uh, we'll have sini go in last is that okay absolutely okay so jacob matthew the manager and chief surgeon of jacob's eye care hospital in ernakulam is going to talk to us uh, the basic step by step approach of eco emulsification for a beginner we're able to see your screen uh, but i think you are still um, muted so dr jacob matthew you unmute yourself yeah can you hear me yes now we can yeah okay sir uh good evening to all of you uh, and uh, thanks for this uh, opportunity uh, so actually, actually you know sorry to interrupt uh, the presentation is not visible only the desktop wallpaper is visible oh yes yes uh, i thought that so
can you see you matter uh, unshare and try again once again we are only seeing the still still your desktop jacob i think you need to stop sharing huh. then open the presentation okay and then go back to screen share and select the presentation from the uh, options that are available there Once uh, again, still the same only. We're not getting the. Uh, okay, I'll try from another. Uh, Jacob, uh, uh, I mean, ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's yes, gone. Yes, yes. Perfect. Okay, actually, I'm doing it from another computer of mine. Uh, Uh, am I audible? Are you audible? But I think you'll have to turn the other computer closer to you. Fine. You have to unmute yourself. Uh, Jacob, as you, as you fix it, should I uh, just yeah. complete? Yeah? You just uh, because because you uh, your your uh, image is turned uh, to one side and all. Uh, probably you should you should uh, uh, log off from the uh, your uh, Apple computer and uh, be on the desktop so that you 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 will be facing facing us. And now you yeah. You're un you're unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Jacob. Uh, uh, we can't hear you. Can you speak? Can you speak? Because uh, Dr. Right? Jacob, you are not audible. audible? Your, your mic is okay, but your audio is not coming. Am I audible? No. Yes. Ah, no, yeah. yes. no yeah. yeah, you yeah. can go into. You can make it full screen and. Uh, full screen. Yeah. Yeah, we can see your uh, presentation. You can go to full screen and start. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, in fact, I'm uh, sorry for the slight deviation in the topic. Actually, it's not a clinical topic. Uh, I thought I'd uh, take a session on. Uh, uh, you know, uh, training in phaco emulsification, which probably the next generation has to uh, come up as uh, surgeons. So uh, the uh, already experienced surgeons, how they should be uh, training the youngsters uh, as they come up. This is what I would like to, you know, share here. So uh, it's probably the only surgery that uh, requires uh, coordination of function between the eyes, both the eyes, ears, hands and both the feet, something like driving an automobile and uh, a proper knowledge of the phaco emulsification machine is also required. It's of prime importance. And unlike uh, the ECCE that we used to do or the SICS, probably hundreds of eyes has to be operated upon to really master the technique. 
And nowadays, the surgery of choice being phaco emulsification, one has to uh, you know, make it better and better. And this is the era of simultaneous bilateral cataract surgery, where the level of sterility in the OT, the disposables, consumables, everything has made uh, the surgery very safe and the risk of infection has come down to a large extent, as well as the possibilities that the patients have in improving their existing vision or any even any pre-existing pre refractive errors is possible with the present day implants that are available. So high level of precision as far as the incisions are concerned, as well as the biometry is assured uh, with the present day gadgets that are available. So uh, it was probably introduced in India during the 1990s, early 1990s, when ECCIL was still the trend in surgery in most institutions, especially medical colleges. And uh, uh, the present day FACO machines are far, far ahead in terms of technology and their uh, arrangement in the, the, the ways you can uh, you know, prepare the machine to make it safe while doing surgeries. In mid 90s, uh, the manual SIC started gaining popularity. And uh, um, so by the turn of the century, um, most of the surgeons who shifted over to phaco emulsification were people who are well trained in SICS and who are doing uh, probably hundreds or thousands of surgeries uh, in the past. Uh, and in the initial uh, turn of the century, the rigid lenses were still being used uh, in phaco emulsification uh, till the point where uh, companies like Alcon and Allergan started coming out with foldable eye holes. The uh, holder folder technique by Alcon and the unfolder by Allergan were the first few uh, you know, uh, techniques of introducing the foldable eye hole through the smallest of incisions at that stage. And uh, uh, very few institutions uh, are now actually providing uh, training in phaco emulsification the last few months of the postgraduate uh, training. So, uh, you know, uh, phaco emulsification has started, uh, you know, being picked up by uh, quite young surgeons. But still, I feel that uh, a person who has already uh, experienced in SICS uh, can make a good uh, transition from uh, into phaco emulsification, especially when it comes to the different kind of complicated cataracts. And uh, I feel a close chamber technique has to be experienced uh, before one starts actually do, going into the machine assisted uh, phaco emulsification because a whole lot of advantages, as all of you know, is there. This is a quote by uh, Shushruda. Uh, where, you know, whom will you train? You know, there are uh, a particular aptitude that a person looks forward to uh, when you tra train another person. It should be highly motivated, willing to, you know, go through the struggle of learning a new technique. And the younger the person, they pick up the, uh, you know, Jacob, I can't hear you now. You've gone off. Um, Jacob, your audio is gone. I think he is. Oh, it's fine now. Yeah. No, no, sir. No, sir. It's me, sir. Uh, is he there online? I can't hear him. No, 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 I can't hear him. No, his, uh... There's no sound coming. I think only the light got stuck. Okay. Jacob, are you there? <laughs> He's not responding. So, let's... Uh, uh, so, I mean... I'll, I'll, I'll. So can I can I uh, just start and finish for the minutes? 
people who are watching don't get bored or yeah i know or can we uh, can somebody call dr jacob to find out what's happening and in the meanwhile can we have srini start yeah i'll uh, can you can you see my presentation ah srini you're on yeah. great yeah so uh, so about surgical mm -hmm. uh, correction of uh, fakia great please go ahead srini so it's it's, uh, uh, it's it's always a difficult act to follow follow these people uh, shabaz uh, matthew he, he, you go to all the conferences anywhere uh, matthew has hundreds of real fans and uh, be representing in front of uh, such a great uh, person like uh, dr bhai woman it's, it's it's a great privilege so uh, so we could uh, uh, we could actually see uh, 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 dr shabaz trying to put uh, uh, the intraocular lens in all all difficult uh, situations into the pack so that is that is what we uh, try to achieve a uh, posterior chamber intraocular lens in in the pack uh, see in the early uh, 2000s uh, uh, there was a survey uh, done from uh, uh, api center uh, uh, gobal pillai was uh, one of the people he was telling the story uh, and the rpc foundation day meeting uh, so he's telling So they they did a survey in a, in a particular area in North India to find out uh, uh, which is the most common cause uh, uh, for blindness uh, in that area. You know what uh, uh, what was the conclusion? What was the commonest cause for blindness? It was epilepsy. So that is uh, uh, one more reason why we should actually listen to uh, uh, Dr. Jacobs talk. Uh, see uh, how how uh, well uh, the kids are being trained these days and uh, uh, from KSO side, KSO scientific committee uh, uh, as a part of the KSO scientific committee CMC, we did uh, uh, a program where uh, we actually introduced uh, different institutions and uh, the training programs, cataract surgery training programs in this uh, in these institutions uh, uh, Dr. Arun Mori uh, was kind enough to be a, a part of it and he, he showed how uh, the heads up surgery the 3D surgery is uh, helping in training so, uh, so basically uh we want to uh, have an uh, intraocular lens inside if uh, uh, if possible you uh, make all attempts uh, to put uh, an intraocular lens in the in the back so uh, no financial interest at all uh, see if if, uh, if it is a uh, subluxated cataract you put a, a ctr so if it uh, subluxation is not uh, uh, just just put a ctr Uh, complete the fecomus education put uh, put intraocular lens in the bag if it is uh, a slaga as uh, dr shabas so you might have to put a uh, suture suture uh, ctr hey, uh, whatever it is your uh, our attempt is to put an intra but what will you do with this see this is uh, this is a, a cataract uh, hanging from some zonules only this is a cataract that has subluxated into the anterior chamber obviously uh, pci will start for this this is this is an iol that is put uh, years back uh, in a pseudo exfoliation this is something that we should really understand like uh, you put it in the back over time it might uh, uh, subluxate so in those cases these are the choices that are uh, available one is obviously the aci iol uh, then you have the scleral fixation or the iris fixation it can be to either the anterior surface of the iris or the posterior surface of the iris the aci iol if it is done well it's good but uh, it is uh, definitely associated with the corneal and uh, other problem so scleral fixation uh, see, has has gone through different uh, phases like initially it uh, used to be a, a sutured uh, one then uh, the, the dr amara garwal introduced that uh, glued iol it's basically uh, you have a uh, have a tunnel a, a scleral pocket where you tuck in uh, the the three the haptics of the three piece iol so so that is uh, uh, you make the uh, scleral pocket there and uh, uh, tuck in uh, the haptic there and this uh, this keeps the and you put it so this is uh, this is another technique where you uh, uh, do it uh, the scleral pocket transconjunctal and uh, uh, and you you uh, 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 introduce the haptic you railroad the haptic into uh, the uh, 26 gene or it was 26 gene needle bent 26 gene needle and uh, you trim it it, it, it goes trans transconjunctively uh, uh, cauterize it to uh, uh, make a uh, bulb there at the end of the uh, uh, haptic and the same thing same thing is repeated on the other side you can see uh, the transconjunctival uh, scleral pocket being made uh, comes out uh, make the bulb there and uh, this is these are the uh, uh, these blue points are, are the ones that uh, you see that's it 
but uh, see this is uh, what i uh, prefer to do this is my choice and uh, see, i've been i've been doing this uh, posterior uh, skill fixation of uh, uh, iris crow lenses for a long time like uh, this uh, was i got the uh, best paper certificate for a presentation on this this is a long term uh, follow up of uh, uh, retropupillary posterior iris crow lens for surgical correction of the fakia got the best paper award in uh, 2011 so, so i've been uh, doing it uh, uh, for a long time and uh, why i uh, was talking about uh, uh, the survey by uh, dr gopal it uh, was dr gvs murthy in fact uh, so was that see at that period of time the training was not uh, that great and uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, eyes that were being uh, left fake so uh, the the choice of uh, correction in those cases used to be uh, anterior chamber intraocular lenses this this uh, probably uh th- this is basically a uh, designed by my by my guru uh, dr jk reddy uh so so uh, the iris crow lenses uh, for uh, uh, used to be uh, put on the anterior surface of the iris right so it used to be a smaller one so so he had uh, no no financial interest for me in this excel optics uh, so this uh, he designed for uh, excel optics and this uh, so initially the uh, overall diameter was 9 mm the optic diameter was 5.5 mm uh, these are the Uh, haptics uh, which have a split at the center and the split at the uh, center forms a, a claw into which uh, the uh, haptics can be uh, uh, the, the the iris can be uh, caught there so this is it uh, this is from excel optics now now it is not 9 mm because i i was talking to uh, uh, jk sir said so like when it is 9 mm you have to enclave it much in the periphery and the pupil was uh, uh, not really round and i get that cat eye pupil and so so he said okay uh, uh, the the design was changed to have the overall uh, 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 diameter of 8 mm here so that is that is what is there uh, in the market from uh, excel optics so so surgery is done through a, a scleral tunnel and uh, two side ports are made uh, 90 degrees away from the uh, scleral tunnel uh, and these uh, side ports are diametrically opposite to each other so pupil uh, uh, constricted palpable but if it's too much constricted uh, the second haptic enclavation might be an issue uh, you use heel on uh, uh, or sorry hard net to uh, to uh, for uh, not uh, uh, any other uh, viscoelastic cuz you want the uh, the ac to be deep and uh, uh, stable so you introduce the intraocular lens uh, into the anterior chamber initially it is kept on the anterior surface iris then it is rotated so that the haptics are oriented towards the side ports uh, so you catch the iol at the optic and tilt the iol in such a way that it goes under the iris to the pupil and you tilt it up to cause tenting of the iris then using a uh, straight rod uh, introduced through the side port you push the iris onto the haptic claw there i show the uh, uh, claw there so iris is pushed down onto the haptic claw it goes directly down vertically down and a bit of iris tissue is entrapped there so uh, the iol is fixated onto the posterior surface of the iris at one point now the same thing is repeated on the si- other side you you interchange stands the uh, the straight rod goes to uh, the other hand and again the same thing the second haptic goes under the iris to the pupil and it is tilted up to cause tenting of the iris then you push the iris onto the haptic claw now Uh, see if if if, if you are uh, not sure that in a iris side if you have been uh, trapped there you can uh, push it down again so now you see at the end you have a very stable uh, intraocular lens you wash off the uh, uh, viscoelastic uh, uh, reasonably round pupil so this is uh, 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 this is extremely this is a, a very quick surgery and absolutely wonderful uh, uh, result see this is this is what uh, used to happen with that 9 mm uh, optic uh, 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 overall diameter one see see, uh, see i i tend to uh, uh, retain this this was referred to me like surgery done years back so you have some uh, lens material there some capsule uh, remnants there, but i don't uh, uh, usually remove them because see one problem it, it is not really a problem but when you see it on a uh, slit lamp you see that pseudo fake donors in this case so so that if you uh, uh, what i have seen is that uh, if you uh, leave whatever capsular remnants that are there uh, the, the the terminusness the pseudo focodonosis is uh, overcome uh, to a great extent and this is 
this is what, uh, what i meant like when the overall diameter is a bit too much uh, it uh, you gives you get a uh, regular people but the uh, real advantage that the uh, it, see it doesn't cause, cause any any problem for sure really but and uh, if, if in your initial phase is if you have a uh, regular people like this you are actually sure that the inflammation uh, has happened but uh, you, you always try to uh, go for a uh, round paper and see i i initially started uh, this with a Uh, that small, uh, the anterior uh, chamber, uh, the one one that is inflated on the anterior uh, surface of the anus, very small uh, intraocular lens, and uh, I used to uh, use it to inflate uh, it onto the posterior surface uh, of the anus. I'm sorry, but the uh, poor uh, video quality. So, but in those cases, I've done quite a few uh, with them. Always, always the uh, the pupil used to be wrong. So this is the uh, the other one uh, that I showed, like uh, uh, the IOL. CTR, everything is in the bank. It was stable for a long time. It's a progressive pseudo exfoliation. That's that's why, like, uh, if it is a, a pseudo exfoliation, there is a possibility that over time everything will go down. So I I am a, a very conservative surgeon. I don't do anything uh, uh, fancy here. I just take everything out and uh, uh, the iris core lens goes in, and the same thing, like. Uh, Uh, the second haptic uh, goes under the uh, iris to the pupil, and uh, you push the iris uh, onto the uh, haptic one. So, uh, so one question, uh, my comes to what are you using as a straight rod? I personally use a uh, use a Sinski hook. I I just break off the tip. So you have a, a, a thinner uh, uh, straight rod there, and uh, it helps uh, really well. So, so again, the, uh, you have a stable intraocular. As I said, like. Here there are uh, there is some uh, uh, capsular remnants remaining. I don't take them off. And see the the design, uh, the technique of uh, iris scroll lens implantation has evolved over the years. So when when we started using, very few few people uh, were using uh, the the iris scroll lens and the retropupillary fixate fixating it on the posterior surface of the iris. Now. Everyone, the, the, uh, sort of it has become uh, the f- first choice. Like, uh, uh, it, but you, more people are using uh, this more than the uh, skill fixation because it's it's uh, it's easier to do. But see, so, uh, some time uh, later, see, I I have always been asking uh, JK sir. See, uh, we were not doing a PI initially in these cases, but uh, see, lot of like I, I said, uh, a thousand thousand plus I have done. But once I had that uh, IOP uh, spike, like it, it was if effectively a pupillary block. From that time onwards, I've been doing a, a PA, and I I told it to uh, uh, JK sir, sir, he he didn't he didn't actually agree. He said no, Sami, this is this is not needed at all. Then once he was doing a a, a life uh, uh, surgery at at uh, Sangra uh, Sangra Kumbhakar, uh, selling. Uh, sometimes you learn from your your students. See, I, uh, uh, I, Srini said you should have to do a PA. I was not listening to him, but I, I got uh, uh, a pupillary block. Now I'm uh, doing PSD. Uh, uh, but I was thinking, I was uh, telling sir, if if there is a vault there, if there is a vault there, the the chance of pupillary block will be much lesser. But uh, sir said like, Srini, if you, if you make a vault and uh, in case the surgeon puts it ultra like uh, uh, reverse, then. Hundred percent, there is going to be a pupil block. So, but see, for some time, uh, the Excel optic uh, IOLs were not available, and uh, I I got this from uh, upper 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 sun. So here you can see it has a step fall there, and uh, you can see, uh, see uh, from then uh, I've been uh, using it, and uh, you can see that uh, vaulting here. Some some degree of uh, vaulting is uh, uh, there. And uh, you make sure that uh, the curvature goes behind, and this is this. So it is very easy to uh, see under uh, under uh, microscope. Uh, this is another case in which I had to remove the uh, CTR uh, bag IOL complex in the case of uh, progressive pseudo exfoliation. That is why uh, those those blood is there. That's why the clarity is not uh, not that great. And one thing here that see once I started using this. Walter didn't draw the lens. Initially, I was found, finding it difficult because the the direction in which the second instrument was uh, going for that axial optic point, as I, I, I said at the beginning, was vertically down. 
So here I was finding it difficult because there is a wall. Now uh, with this, I changed the way in which I was enclavating. See, it goes slightly slanting. You can see it, it, it didn't go directly down. It goes a bit, uh, 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 a, a bit obliquely, and that has been uh, helping me uh, uh, put, put these intraocular lenses. And I would work for this uh, intraocular lens. It has uh, made my life uh, uh, now. Like uh, initially, when I started in uh, the late uh, 2000 and uh, 2009, 10, uh, 11, and all, I uh, started. I, I used to get a lot of reference for uh, this uh, secondary iodine implantation, but nowadays. Uh, as Dr. Jacob had started uh, talking about it, and as you can see, like the training has improved, and uh, almost everyone has uh, now become a good, wonderful uh, surgeon. So, oh, so if you do a survey now, FAKIA won't be a, uh, uh, even a minor cause for uh, 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 blindness in any area. But still, there are conditions like what I showed, like if the zones are not uh, good enough, then you'll have to use a uh, non PCIO uh, case and uh, still uh, skill fixation is supposed to be the uh, gold standard but in my hand in my hand uh, for me uh, iris cold lens uh, being a pure anterior segment surgeon uh, working uh, where uh, I mean I do about uh, 800 takeholes in a month I don't have a vitro surgery backup in uh, either of my uh, uh, two institutes so uh, in my hands uh, Iris color lens and this technique has worked really well. The question, one question people ask is, will the pupil dilate? Yes, it will dilate uh, for anything. Uh, will there be any inflammation? No, there won't be inflammation. Will it be stable? Yes, it will be stable because the, the collagen in the iris tissue is uh, probably stronger than uh, what is there in the sclera. The uh, only issue is over time, there might be some pigment uh, loss in the area where uh, the inflammation has happened. That is it. And some uh, degree of uh, pseudophacodonesis is there. It is not going to affect vision at all. Because I've seen uh, big surgeons showing that, oh, no, 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 you can see uh, there is a pseudophacodonesis. It doesn't affect vision at all. Absolutely, it doesn't affect vision at all. And uh, again, uh, I request permission from uh, Arnoi sir and Namra the ma'am uh, to again announce uh, the uh, the 80% annual conference of uh, all the ophthalmological society, but a lot of people are uh, watching. So if you people are not uh, uh, registered, please register. Uh, this is going to be the best a a AOC ever. This Lulu Baldati International Convention Center is the best because uh, people are spending two, three crores uh, in two, three days. See, imagine people spending three crores in two days for their theme wedding. So how, how sought after is this? And uh, we uh, Malayalis are basically uh, good good hosts, and uh, uh, so we are uh, doing our best uh, uh, for a great show there. If you're not registered, please register. One more thing I I have to tell is that what we are uh, arranging this time is uh, we are giving opportunities for different institutions to do their alumni the one one hour. We are giving it in the Borgadi Palace. It's just uh, two three minutes walk from uh, uh, this this plot. We had booked uh, halls there for. Uh, the scientific session now uh, we'll be doing everything in uh, in the convention center only so there we are giving one one hour uh, each for uh, because what everybody has seen is that big, big institutions have their big bad uh, alumni meetings everyone else wants to do it but you know like uh, everyone we so we could have had a meeting here so we are we are giving opportunities for uh, different institutions to do uh, their meeting so that we, uh, your your alumni knows okay this time you can uh, meet and all uh sorry sorry for uh, uh deviating from uh, from the talk but uh, i couldn't help it because uh, uh, this has become a, a, a passion now, AOC 2023. Uh, thanks a lot uh, uh, for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Srini. That was very, very nice. I tend to agree with you that uh, for me too, uh, the iris claw lens uh, portrait of pupillary is the first choice personally. Though my the VR surgeons in my hospital prefer to do a skeletal fixation of various types either the glued or the Yamane technique, they still prefer that. But I'm quite happy with this as anti segment surgeon, and all the points that you said are quite valid. There is definite uh, pseudophacodonosis. The only question that people throw up uh, is that uh, these uh, lenses cause more CME than others, which I'm not too sure about. But uh, whatever uh, pseudophacodonosis there is uh, doesn't apparently affect the results are good long-term. 
disinclination is very rare, uh, extremely rare. I really haven't seen too many. So that kind of uh, disinclavations do occur with any other kind of osteolar fixation also. The advantage of uh, iris claw is the ease and the minimal uh, the manipulation that's necessary. Though, yes, uh, there is uh, some argument in favor of fixating it in the past planner in one way or the other, whichever way you choose, either with a suture or with a glue or by the Yamane technique, sounds to be theoretically more physiological than this. Uh, this is open to arguments. In my vote is in favor of whatever you are doing. So let's ask the others, uh, what about Matthew Kurian? He's smiling in a funny way. <laughs> what uh, does he think? <laughs> I've been a bit hesitant about using Iris Club, but watching Srini's videos, you know, it's like, uh, it looks so simple, but I think it's uh, his expert hands that makes it look so simple. Uh, <clears throat> I've had a couple of situations where I had uh, uh, bleed from the root of the iris, uh, uh, with extensive vitreous hemorrhage subsequently, which took a long time to resolve. I hope it spikes after that. And uh, a couple of patients with uh, significant dysphotopsias uh, because of uh, uh, sort of very vertically oval, um, uh, pu distorted pupil rather, not vertically oval, uh, dis uh, oval distortion of the pupil. So uh, uh, having experienced those things, and uh, because I was so comfortable with uh, the classical sutured uh, or scleral fixated uh, uh, iris technique, uh, I have uh, reverted back now to uh, the scleral fixation technique rather than... Uh, you should do a few more. I'm sure you will change your mind very soon. Yeah, uh, uh, like, uh, like uh, Pragasa, vitreoral surgeon, it's a prolific vitreoral surgeon, uh, uh, from Tuscalicat. Uh, he, he has gone gone to uh, iris fixation from uh, scale fixation. He is now doing uh, iris fixation only. And regarding uh, uh, the, the dysphotopsia, see, like, initially, like, maybe in 2010 or 11, there was a patient who came with that big SI. It was a clear-cut ICC done years back. And uh, the other I did uh, uh, PCIO and he was very happy and he wanted to. And I was thinking, but uh, uh, what to do? It was a great uh, SI. And uh, it's no, sir, you try. I mean, that, 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 some people have so much belief in me. So I, 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 I put an iris crawl in. It is like you, you get that sinking in trotter. It's like the one that is sinking, you have. But the patient didn't, maybe you want to complain or what? He didn't complain at all. He was very happy, no disorder. It, it is like there is an SI superiorly and you can see the margin of the uh, eye over there. But uh, it, it was wonderful. Uh, 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 Matthew, you are a uh, hundred times better surgeon than me. It is, it is absolutely going to uh, 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 work in your hands. It's, uh, it's just that it's just, uh, uh, somehow like... Uh, uh, Mindset. <laughs> yes. Mindset. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Fine. Is uh, Jacob Matthew back online? Is he going to come back? Uh, I, I don't see uh, any activity on his uh, window. Uh, he's also... Yeah. yeah, yes, yes, uh, uh, yes, Jacob, we can see your Thank presentation. You. Jacob, you are not audible. Uh, am I audible now? Uh, yeah, yes. now, now you are audible. Yes. Uh, yeah. you, you, can, you can actually continue from where, where you left. Uh, yeah. And go to full screen mode. Okay, super. Yes. Can you hear? Yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, I can hear you. Actually, yeah, deviating from the clinical aspects, I thought, you know, uh, I would uh, talk about, uh, you know, how one can train the beginners in uh, phaco emulsification. Uh, so, uh, you know, how, how you go about uh, with the, the different steps and how, you know, the, a person can be trained gradually to do a fake emulsification. Probably it's the only surgery which, where it requires uh, coordination uh, of both the eyes, ears, hands and feet, like just, just like dr driving an automobile, a car. Uh, so one has to learn how to use all your senses, you know, use your hands and feet and a proper knowledge of 
how the fake emulsification machine works is also very important can you hear me hello 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 yes yes you can hear it. yeah yeah okay uh, okay uh, so uh, it's unlike uh, ecc and sic yes one has to uh, you know do hundreds of eyes before one finally masters the technique uh, because there are different kinds of cataract uh, different kinds of machine the parameters all those things have to be learned before one actually settles down and uh, masters the technique so, so this is the era of simultaneous bilateral cataract surgery or topical clear corneal phaco emulsification where the patient is also aware of different uh, you know options that are available which can correct all their pre existing refractive errors as well and with the multifocal ioles and torix coming in and giving excellent outcome so uh, patients have a lot more of uh, options available and they are willing to spend money to give get the best uh, services and uh, also the pre precise uh own construction uh with the entry of femtosecond laser or all the other precision gadgets like uh, that are being used in biometry one gets the perfect uh, implant power that is supposed to be put into the eye and also the sterility of the ot's with the disposable consumables has reached a extreme level where one can uh, do surgery with the least of uh, risk of infection so the phaco emulsification was first introduced uh, in india in the early 1990s and uh, our uh, old masters actually started doing it in 1992 or 94 uh, during that time many machines were even even installed in south of india and uh, one of them was uh, dr sundramurthy i had worked at lotus i care hospital in coimbatore where he started probably in 1994 and in, in 1990s uh, actually sic started manual sic started getting very popular before that eccil was what was being followed in most of the training institutions especially medical colleges and sic slowly started uh, gaining a popularity so at the, the turn of the century there were a lot of good trained sic surgeons who could be introduced into phaco emulsification much more easily because many of the maneuvers and steps were almost similar in phaco emulsification in fact lot more brief and shorter so one could easily adapt to the uh, the new technique and rigid ioles were available uh, used mostly till 2000 and past 2000 alcon and alorgan came out with foldable ioles alcon with the folder Uh, um, you know holder folder technique and alorgan came out with unfolders so uh, the present day uh, teaching institutions actually have uh, the pgs introduced to phaco during the last 6 months of their training or probably it may be even earlier and uh, but still uh, i personally feel that having trained quite a few uh, people in phaco emulsification a smoother transition is possible when a person is a uh, good sic surgeon uh, especially finally when it comes to more difficult cases in uh, cataract when you have to do fake emulsification on those and then one has to actually experience what a closed chamber technique is uh, with all its advantages before one steps into fake emulsification so this is a quote by uh, susruda uh, where you know the right kind of person should be with the right aptitude for surgery should get into it and uh, i would always look out for a highly motivated uh, person who is willing to uh, put in all his work while uh, you know hard work in learning the new technique the younger the age the lot the a lot better because as you age you become more rigid and less uh, pliable to the different uh, modes and techniques of uh, surgery that is required in phaco emulsification and a keen observer is what uh i have found is very essential one has to learn a lot of uh, you know uh, steps from your masters you watch your seniors work uh, you know uh, through the observer microscope or through the uh, videos that are uh, seen and then one learns a lot of uh, surgery through watching others and uh, also a person who is tough in his mind willing to take the rough and tough 
whether complications come, he's willing to come with another day where he's able to overcome all those. So a wet lab is very important where one works upon animal eyes or artificial chambers with wax nucleus. And it helps uh, get a feel of how the FACO tip works, how the FACO handpiece works. And you get to understand the machine a lot better. And one can always practice uh, steps like the continuous curvilinear capsular axis on these artificial uh, material like the fruit skin, the cigarette pack foils, or thin plastic sheets she that are stretched over a bottle uh, uh, mouth. And uh, also repeated uh, mental workup of what one has to do prior to the surgery day is very important. How you're going to go about doing the tunnel, the uh, rexus, the hydro dissection, and finally, phaco multiplication of the nucleus. So understanding the machine, everything from the tubings, the pliability, the pump, whether it's a peristaltic or venturi, how it works, the handpiece, how it functions. If the audio feedback is very important. One has to listen to how you know the different phases of the pedal in the pitch motion works. So that gives you an idea whether it's an irrigation aspiration or whether it's gone into the phaco mode. So uh, that is very important. And uh, also if it's a yaw that is available on your foot pedal, that uh, has to be used to understand how it works. And also fluidics is something that has to be understood where the inflow often, which is gravity fed and the outflow, which uh, is caused by the suction as well as leak through the ports and the tongue should be neither too small nor too big in size because one can get a phaco burn if it's too large, you know, the leakage will be too much. You will have an, a shallowing of the anterior chamber. Various terminologies are taught to them. Occlusion, uh, what occlusion is, vacuum, how the aspiration flow rate is set and how it works. The rise time uh, of vacuum upon occlusion. And what happens in occlusion break, a surge and follow bleaching, chatter, all these uh, terminologies one has to understand. The, the more numbers that... A, patient, a person is able to do, one learns more and more about the machine, the fluidics, and also when something goes wrong, like the blockage of the tubings, uh, when the bottle light is not in the right, right level, a defective cassette with errors of, uh, being shown repeatedly by the machine for no reason at all, how one has to go about correcting it and then carry on with your surgery. And uh, even the eyes can differ because a shallow anterior chamber, what one should be doing when you introduce the probe, the integrity of the back can vary depending on the laxity of the sonules as in pseudo exfoliation and also capsular defects as in trauma or posterior polar cataracts. One should know how to go about doing the surgery. So even in a hypermature or hard cataract, the longer you take, often the vitreous gets hydrated and the posterior capsule gets pushed forwards, often you ending up with a rent. And all this uh, realization comes only when one does more and more numbers. This uh, photo was actually taken in the last uh, state conference of uh, our uh, Kerala. And uh, the company had uh, put up a, a wet lab there with a mannequin head and you know the, uh, the wax nucleus, where one could really feel how the tip works, the handpiece works, the working distance is very important. One should have a microscope where you have adequate distance between the objective and the eye uh, position. Whereas in SICs, probably you use the OM5 and uh, such microscopes where the working distance is a lot less. Coordination of both the hands, uh, how the feet work on the pedal, even the microscope adjustments with your left leg, uh, all that has, can be understood. And also when you sit at the head end of the patient, uh, how the probe is introduced and how the eye sort of tilts down. Uh, all this is experienced when one does your wet lab training. Always record your uh, you know, surgeries. The logbook is very important. Also introduce to them all the rules that have been to be followed in a theater. The OT list, the uh, registers like uh, the IOL register, the surgery registers, the uh, the uh, Consumables also have to be entered, the batch number and things like that. So that any problem that comes in future, you have an infection, you should always be able to go back and try to study how uh, things went wrong. 
a stepwise approach for a trainee is what i would always prefer a trainee sh should first uh, feel how the i uh, you know the ball feels when you create the tunnel and also uh, a rexus can be uh, given initially uh, so that a closed chamber how easily one can do a rexus a scleral tunnel is something that i would always advise because of the sturdy nature of the tissue and uh, less chance of uh, end of thalmitis even if a prolonged surgery or a vitreous loss is encountered and uh, the logbook helps in uh, both the trainee and the trainer to assess the person's aptitude for surgery and how he grasps the different surgical steps one can discuss each day once the surgery is over and uh, other major steps like you know how the side pods are created the tunnel size good size rexes where the nucleus can be uh, you know rotated easily so that you know the trends and the rotating of the nucleus while doing one trends is uh, facilitated and handling of the probe how it is introduced through the tunnel how the angle of attack should be and the movement uh, like a boat like uh, motion through the nucleus deeper at the center and shallow at the periphery this is a video that uh, was taken back in 2002 while i was in aravind where you know two different uh, uh, kind of tunnel can be uh, you know advice uh, for a, a beginner uh, one is a limbel based uh, tunnel where you know you create a groove at the limbus and then you know you use your crescent blade uh, to you know uh, make a square shaped uh, you know pocket in the stroma and then you finally enter using the keratom uh those times i think we used to use a 3 or 3.2 mm uh, keratom to make the final entry into the anterior chamber so a square shaped uh, tunnel is always advisable uh you know you have to adequately go into the clear cornea before uh, you enter the anterior chamber and like in sics where you uh, you know make an early entry into the anterior chamber so a square shaped wound there you can see and uh, on those times we used to use rigid iols for our trainees because foldable iols were just coming into the market and uh, we used to use a 5 or 5.5 mm rigid iol uh, for our surgeries so uh, that's the you know the that's the scleral tunnel being shown it's a smaller sized uh, uh, scleral pocket that one has to create with the crescent blade unlike in sics so it's much more easier to make a tunnel for a trainee who is not trained in sics this part is actually a lot more easier and then uh, again a uh, square shaped uh, incision being made uh, and finally the uh, three plane incision is being uh, done with the final entry uh, using the keratom so uh, then the rexus has to be taught where you know how they use a combination of the shearing and the ripping force to get a good size rexus so that uh, a, a good hyocortical cleaving hydrodissection can be done and then rotation of the nucleus initially should be done so that uh, one can easily do the trench and then rotate the nucleus each time to, that you are creating a trench in the opposite direction uh, and uh, different kinds of tips and their sharpness can be explained to the trainees a 45 degree tip being used for the harder cat tracks 30 and 15 being used for better hold as in case of stop and chop and uh, direct chop uh, so uh, the cutting will reduce as the tip uh, you know the uh, steepness reduces aspiration flow rate how it works and the vacuum building up uh, how fast it comes up depends on the settings of aspiration flow rate and the final vacuum setting that you have put up the bottle height can be set initially at 80 cm from the eye level and can be increased later to 110 uh, when you go into direct phaco and uh, this is the uh, foot pedal control that three phases in foot pedal control is explained to them uh, the uh, tip of the phaco probe is shown here the rise time uh, in venturi and peristaltic pumps being shown here where once the aspiration flow rate is increased one gets a sharper uh, rise and uh, the anterior chamber anatomy of the eyeball is very important how deep the anterior chamber is how the 
stick the lenses in the center so that you know the trench is made uh, the proper thickness uh, almost 90% you have to go down in the middle at the center and then uh, that is something like three uh, diameter tip diameter at the center and two uh, tip diameter at the periphery uh, so you make a boat like uh, movement as you make your trench and uh, this diagram actually shows uh, what i had mentioned the angle of attack is quite acute you have to go uh, deeper in the center and shallow at the periphery and uh, uh, finally you know how you crack the nucleus you go right to the depth of the nucleus uh, making a 90% trench and then you know you uh, you know crack the nucleus at that deeper level and not on a shallower side and then each uh, nucleus fragment is removed uh, this is the way you should do go deeper with the uh, phaco tip so that you know you uh, bury it and then get a better hold before you remove the fragments one by one as you can see in one of those diagrams the posterior capsule is being pushed up there you can have a rent so uh, adequate uh, fluid inflow will sort of keep the bag inflated and thus help in uh, fragment removal without the risk of uh, pc rent so initial few cases like 20 to 50 cases one should stick to divide and conquer and later on once uh, you learn how to hold the nucleus uh, and uh, do a proper trench then stop and chop technique can be used where you divide the nucleus into two halves and then do a chop on the rest uh, halves and uh, once that also is made confident one can go into direct chop so this is the basic nutshell of what one can do when one goes into training a uh, uh, you know, new uh, person into phaco emulsification. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jacob Matthew. You've actually taken a very difficult uh, and, uh, you know, potentially a boring topic and made it very interesting. You've taken us through all the small, small issues that um, a person who's starting off faces and try to combine both, uh, you know, techniques of doing a proper SICS and a Technique of learning FACO has been quite enlightening. Thank you very much. Thank Any you, questions, Srini? Jacob, can you, can you share your uh, presentation? No, no, no. Presentation is still there? Ah, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I thought no, it's no. finished. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so no, sorry. no, no, no. No, no, no. It's over. It's over. You, you are not go, coming on. You. Yeah. No, okay. yeah. Absolutely yeah. fine. Any, any observations, Shabazz, Srini, or Korean? Uh, uh, see, uh, uh, Jacob, like, uh, yeah. uh, see, when when these uh, people start learning on uh, through the scleral tunnel huh. uh, so uh, uh, is it is it more difficult learning see i, I know that it's safer uh, uh, for conversion uh, the scleral yeah. tunnel i'm not sure yeah. like i'm not really taught quite a, a few of them uh, yeah. so would it be uh, like uh, at least a posterior limbal uh, uh, tunnel which if uh, they get into trouble in the future and uh, go for another uh, section to complete the SICS. Uh, so you said that it's better to go for a scleral tunnel. Why? Uh, uh, because the it's purely, the, uh, purely uh, you know, looking into the uh, risk factors like, you know, developing an infection. And because usually uh, a beginner, they might take a longer time to do their fake emulsification. So the trends itself might take quite a long time and, you know, they end up with a fake burn. Why I mentioned that is there are a few centers where clear corneal incision is being adopted right from the beginning. So that is something I you know don't uh, totally agree to. So uh, either a limbal incision or a, you know scleral tunnel, something like one or two uh, you know millimeters behind the limbus. That is what uh, considering the you know rigidity of the sclera, you know its uh, toughness and all that. That is why I suggest a scleral tunnel. Matthew, you, you have been a prolific uh, teacher uh, over the years. I mean, see, <laughs> as I said earlier, like you go for uh, these meetings. I, I attend a meeting every week. You find at least one or two fans of yours and uh, each each of these places. So, what uh, uh, what do you what do you uh, uh, say on this? So, I I, I think uh, one of the things that I found uh, very successful as a teacher. And from the patient point of view also uh, was very comfortable was that uh, we would allow the uh, student to do 
the initial step so tunnel only and then the cons senior consultant would take over and complete the rest of the procedure so the procedure is not unduly long the over a period of time uh, the tunnel would be performed by the senior consultant rexus would be performed by the student hydro would be performed by the student so then by the end of a week tunnel rexus hydro is completed by the student while the consultant takes over the rest of the case the second case or the third case on that day would be exactly reverse where the senior consultant would perform the tunnel rexus hydro uh, in reasonably short time and then give a perfect tunnel rexus hydro to the student so that the student is then able to focus only on the aspect of nucleus management so a pair of cases or three cases a day is what we were giving with uh, steps uh, shared between the senior consultant as well as the student so that one risk of complications is slower patient is more comfortable and during nucleus management most students find it difficult because the tunnel is not perfect or the rexus is not perfect nucleus is not uh, fully mobile because of a poor hydro resection so those uh, risks were eliminated and then having done this step by step procedure over a period of 2 weeks we would then allow the uh, student to do a larger and larger combinations so that by the end of 2 to 3 weeks the individual is comfortable doing almost all the steps uh, under supervision with little or no risk to the patient and in a fairly rapid uh, uh, time frame so typically 15 to 20 minutes uh, at the end of 3 weeks is what we were able to achieve in most situations do i agree with that sir and tunnel i no longer recommend because that means the surgery more difficult so limbal is okay and putting a suture is not a issue at all so nowadays like mostly you do ecc or you do feco sics is slowly coming out and uh, really Hey, why do you say you 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 are very dangerous uh, uh, area? Uh, 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 you have a uh, 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 group there, and they are there. They are performing surgeries through 1.5 millimeter missing. Uh, uh, so I, I don't think SIS is not SIS is a wonderful surgery. Uh, absolutely wonderful surgery. You you get uh, the best results. You do an SIS through a temporal tunnel. Uh, uh, the induced astigmatism is almost nil. Uh, you will have that uh, uh, the foreign body sensation, this, that, and all. Uh, and it, it 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 is it is something that you go for when you have a problem with phacomatism. I, I feel that you should you should everyone should do uh, uh, you uh, uh, learn as I did. Uh, and nothing, uh, uh, nothing. It is uh, uh, there is no inferiority of as I did to phacom. Uh, uh, that's uh, that's my point. The, but the problem is over time like uh, when i was uh, uh, doing a lot of uh, sics i could i could finish sics in uh, uh, probably 3 minutes 4 uh, minutes now i i take at least 3 4 minutes more than uh, feco i finish in 5 minutes i i take about uh, uh, 8 9 10 minutes even for sics because you are not uh, uh, you are not doing it that very regularly and uh, probably for those very difficult cases on only, only, only you do it so so uh, just the fact that you you are not keeping on doing uh, an sics and you are not really uh, comfortable uh, uh, with that you are much more comfortable with feco uh, uh, probably that is the stage where, where i am in doesn't mean that the sics uh, uh, is out or bad and that it's, it's a uh, uh, wonderful surgery uh, uh, matthew your your uh, uh, take on that yeah uh, i completely agree you know uh, since we are doing more and more feco my speed and comfort with uh, sics has actually become a slightly lesser but being uh, in the past a confident sics surgeon allows me to approach a lot more cases uh, because i know i have the backup where i can uh, bail out of a feco uh, complication by uh, converting to sics and you still have the advantages of uh, square wound Uh, relatively uh, astigmatically neutral incision and uh, uh, the uh, rest of the uh, you know the fact that you have a plan b escape allows you to approach the surgery with a lot more confidence and feco i feel is uh, 95% uh, 
uh, mental confidence game and uh, uh, being a good SIC surgeon makes it much easier for a FACO surgeon. Yeah, Arun Mori, sir, uh, uh, sir, also is a person who doesn't do SICS, I believe, right? I tell you why. I tell you why. Very simple. When I started doing FACO, SICS didn't exist. We all learned FACO first. And SICS yeah. came at least four or five years later. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, people of my uh, generation really have poor... Uh, Absolutely. That is... That is... That is one one SICS, I can do a reasonably good one. Yeah. So I mentioned that, you know, so I think... Yeah. 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 Like, like that is what has happened in uh, RP Center also. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, see, they started. There, there was no SICS at that time. I I still remember uh, Dr. H K Tiwari was the chief of RP Center coming to uh, Shangara Coimbatore and watching uh, the SICS. I was with him uh, because uh, uh, H K T sir was my uh, guide and uh, Dr. Lalit was my chief guide. So he was watching through that that window there. And it's like we had uh, four microscopes, eight tables. <laughs> Uh, people are just lying down, getting up, lying down, getting up. This really stunned. What are you people doing? So he went and uh, went back to office and told uh, uh, Dr. Rezi Bihar, hey, you people have been fooling us with FACO. Those people are doing, because he saw the post of all, it's all, all clean cases. So it is, it is as, uh, 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 but, but still in office center, uh, uh, SAS is, is not a preferred technique. Like, uh, 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 like sir, uh, they uh, they were uh, FACO and they they uh, they're good FACO surgeon. Uh, uh, probably the, uh, uh, there won't be anybody who's better than Arun uh, sir uh, in FACO. So so they, they uh, never had the reason uh, uh, to go for uh, uh, SSS. But I uh, basically learned uh, uh, with SSS. So that is always there. That, uh, it, it won't go off. Like uh, yeah. uh, but you might you might like like money that thing lost uh, lost his uh, uh, steps in uh, uh, spinning when he was in. England at that time, and then he had to come back and uh, learning it. Uh, so, so that's 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 just the thing. It is it is still there. You can uh, uh, pick it uh, uh, pick it again, and it it's, it's, uh, it helps you. It is a backup plan. And uh, Jacob, like the, your your opinion. Yeah, uh, like you said, you know, SICS uh, in your hands is always something you can you know fall back on when you have a complication, when uh, you know the nucleus is uh, very hard, or you know. Uh, where you know you can't do your FACO. Uh, there might be a few cases where you know you still have to do either an ECCIL or SICS, and that is where actually your experience in SICS comes in. So uh, this uh, knowing FACO and then sticking to it without knowing how to handle the complications that could be a you know catastrophe. So I, I strongly feel that you know if you know SICS, it's a lot more easier because the steps are already something that you're already doing probably a larger rexus or a you know larger tunnel so you know all these steps become a lot more easier for a SICS surgeon that's what i meant no, so a teaching person you have a complication yeah. in fact yeah. not making a good SICS with that you have to explain yeah, exactly you are yeah. making the suture there so whether yeah. it's not SICS it should be like some, something in between so it is not like uh, you have to extend the incision and then you have to do, take the nucleus, you have to put one or two suits. So that is like your high uh, instability rather than telling that SICS you have to learn. But I guess, <laughs> no, it's not that you have to learn it, but then if you know SICS, it's a lot, it's a lot more easier. Yeah. That's what I mean. And, and, and one, more, one more take home, like we, I, I, I saw the, this real class surgery by Dr. You know, uh, uh, Shahbaz. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, top class surgeries by Matthew and uh, Jacob and all. Uh, 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 an advice or uh, opinion from my part, uh, so who are uh, just beginners who are watching it, you don't have to be as, as good as uh, these people to, to do uh, 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 real, say, wonderful takeover. Yeah. See, uh, as uh, Matthew said, it's all there in your mind. What What is your hand syndrome and everything comes secondary. You you should you should have the willingness to learn. You should believe that you can do it. Uh, you should. Uh, I mean, once you believe that you can do it, and once you put in your mind to it, nothing matters. You are going to become a, a wonderful fake surgeon. Uh, uh, see again, I'm telling you, uh, it, see, great surgeons uh, uh, like Shahbaz and Matthew Puri and Jacob and all might uh, finish it uh, finish a surgery in. Uh, three, four minutes and all. What is wrong in finishing in eight minutes or 10 minutes? Uh, what is uh, uh, finally, what, what do you want the patient to have uh, the best result? So 
one should be comfortable be confident uh, that you can yeah. actually achieve uh, wonderful uh, results anybody can achieve wonderful results if you are if you are uh, really putting your uh, uh, mind to uh, learning the steps and uh, see uh, uh, again i, I tell uh, everywhere so the complications uh, happen in the initial stages uh, of your career because of your ignorance later on the complications happen because of your complacence or your arrogance so so these are two things the ignorance you can uh, uh, practice and come over it uh, later on the complacence and all should not to pick in uh, so that's uh, because i i, I know there there might be a lot of uh, beginners who, who watching it because uh, all these wonderful surgeons are there so this is this is just just my uh, my advice uh, to those people Yeah. Are you saying that the team is not? You're saying something? Yeah. I have to go back there. Yeah. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you sir. Thanks a lot. And uh, thank, thank you. Thank you again for being the sponsors. Thank yeah. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.